Hello, friends, and welcome once again to Your Creativity. We are excited to be back during uh, quarantine times. I am Terry Burden, and I am here via Zoom with the always excellent to see Dylan Maziotti. Dylan, hello. Hey, Terry. How have you been? I'm doing great. Uh, we send our warmest regards to Steve Hatch, who couldn't be with us today, but uh, he's always with us in spirit. And I'm excited to introduce today's guest, zooming in from the beautiful Los Angeles. Uh, she is a comedian. She is an actor and a New Yorker, as well as an Angelino, which I think is probably about as uh, cool of a double hit as far as uh, metropolitan areas of the United States of America. Zainab Johnson, welcome. Thank so you. nice to have you with us. How are you? I am doing great. Um, considering I am doing great. Thank you. Are you making it okay through the quarantine? Yeah, I'm making it okay. I mean, I feel like you're making it okay if you still have a roof over your head and you're coronavirus free, right? It's true. It's true. And, and you haven't cracked up, which uh, in all seriousness, I know that, that there's been a, a lot of talk on social media and I've connected with a lot of people who have been uh, really uh, speaking about the all-important topic of mental health during this time. And of course, a lot of it comes down to the conditions of your quarantine, uh, yeah. who you're with or not with. So how have your conditions been? Well, I'm quarantining by myself. I'm quarantining in my apartment. And while I would not consider my apartment to be very big, I don't know, maybe it's like 700 square feet, it's, I do feel like it's kind of closing in on me. Before the, this pandemic happened, I was actually searching for homes. And I am now really like way more anxious than I was before to move. <laughs> in uh, a word, get out. Yeah, to, yeah. I mean, I'm very, you know, I found that it's been very helpful during this process to, you know, not sound cliche, but have an attitude of gratitude. Yes, absolutely. You know, and so I bought some plants when it first started. I've never been a plant person. I've never been able to keep a, a plant alive. I have been doing very well with two plants. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. Warmest yeah. congratulations. Yeah, I probably ate out 90% of my meals the past five years and for the past two months, every single day, every single meal, I have been cooking myself. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just kind of focusing on, you know, when I go into the bathroom, I'm like, I'm, look, I got toilet paper, all is well, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, good for you and uh, good for your mental health. Have you, um, have you taken any uh, special measures to kind of keep yourself sane since you're by yourself? Well, I do. I've probably FaceTimed more with people than I have ever in my life. Um, and I, I try to have a routine. I try to set an alarm and get up in the morning. Yes. At certain times. Yes. Um, I try to do things throughout the day that are going to, one, help pass the time to keep me focused. And if I'm focused in that, that lessens my anxiety. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, when, when you're sitting on your couch or, or in, you know, whatever chairs you have in your house, when you do that every day for this consecutive days, it, it's very hard to feel productive, like to physically feel productive. Sure. But I find when I write a list every night of, the, of what I'm going to do the next day and I accomplish that list, I feel very productive. It doesn't nice. feel like I'm sitting around, although I might have been just seated all, you know, seated sure. all. Sure, sure. So uh, certainly we'll uh, talk more about coronavirus, I'm sure. I hope and, so. uh, as, as is uh, apropos for the present times, I'm always in this moment uh, trying to sort of do the calculus on uh, whether or not we go back and kind of start at the beginning of your journey 
uh, in New York and from uh, your mathematics degree to uh, the stage. And I have to say, uh, any time that I meet a stand-up comic, I, um, I, I have pre-respect. And I say that as somebody who kind of did a, a, a bit of stand-up on uh, the beginning of a television talk show for a number of years. Oh, but, were you the warm-up guy? No, I w well, I was the warm-up guy for the other guy who was also me, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, I, I guess you could say uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Criss Cross. Warm it up, Chris. Uh, back in the day, I would warm myself up. So okay, okay. Um, but I was also warming up uh, a, a television studio with no studio audience. So if I could get some yucks out of the band, that was always good. But of course, none of that has anything to do with the courage that it takes to uh, stand on a naked stage with only a microphone to defend yourself. So uh, kudos to you for. Uh, being a part of that august profession but i think we should probably start off with talking about amazon and talking about what's happening for you right now because you are i i still want to say you're on tv but <laughs> on some in some way and given the production values uh being on Amazon or being on Netflix kind of is the modern television. So tell us about your experience and about your transition from the stage to the screen. Yeah, I think people start to think once the Emmys recognizes a streaming platform, that sort of legitimizes it. And yes. I think that that happened with Orange is the New Black for Netflix years mm -hmm. back. And I think that that happened, I mean, Amazon, come on, we got, uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, we have Fleabag, and now they have Upload. Um, I, I am very happy to be on Upload. You know, it's an Amazon original show. It's a half hour comedy um, created by Greg Daniels, who is responsible for the US office, Parks and Recreation, King of the Hill, et cetera. Um, we we premiered in May. We're still in May, right? Um, that's what I'm having a hard time with. Yeah. <laughs> the um, date. The date. That's that's why at the beginning I was like three months. I'm like, oh no, wait a minute, two months. Ah. Um, uh, but yeah, we premiered May first, um, and it was a lot of anxiety around that because we're in like uncharted te territory, you know. I um, mean, and, and I think sometimes people don't realize the amount of time it takes to make a TV show. So if I can just share Absolutely. that, you know, we we. We take the pilot in 2018, we shot the series in 2019, and it premiered mid-2020 during a pandemic, you know? Um, yeah. But I'm very happy that it was so, it's been, and it's, and it's continuing to be so well received. Um, I think TV Guide this week said that it was the best new comedy on, you know, of 2020, or best new TV show of 2020. Um, we got to see- That's fantastic. TV. Yeah, we got a season two. And I think that like in life, good news is fantastic. But during a pandemic, good <laughs> news is like heavenly, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so so that's been that's been wonderful. I mean, 100 Humans is on Netflix, which is another streaming platform. It's really interesting because sometimes people like will introduce me on like a Zoom comedy show now and she'll be like, she has two shows on Netflix. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Amazon's like, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, it, I hope to have six shows on Netflix, six shows on Amazon, you know? But uh, I think that people just put things together. You know, if they're able to watch it, they don't care where they're watching it. If they're watching yes. it good, that's all that matters. We've certainly become platform agnostic in this world, and especially as the technology is so great yeah. that, right, I, I'm on my phone, and here we are having this great conversation. I will say, and this is not because I'm on the network, I will say that logistically and the like interface of it, my favorite platform is Amazon because Amazon does an x-ray. Do you know what that is? I do not. 
Amazon, when you watch a show on Amazon, and you anywhere you scroll over the show, it lets you know on the screen who the performers are. Oh what yeah, the yeah, they yeah. are interesting yeah. questions. You can you can you can step out and, and and play a quiz like a fun quiz about the person you're watching. You know, and that so for me the reason why I like that feature is because so many times I am watching something on HBO or Netflix or you know, right Amazon or anything. And I have to stop and I have to pick up my phone or my computer and I have to start searching because when you start watching somebody that you like or some somebody that interests you or so you want more information. Absolutely. And Life story. To, yeah, you have to go to a different device to find that information. But Amazon said, no, 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 no. We never want you to leave our platform. Right. But we're right. gonna give it all to you. Matter of fact, when you're done watching, why don't you buy a yoga mat? <laughs> <laughs> You uh, sure you don't have any vitamins you need to pick up? We'll get it to you later today. <laughs> now, Zainab, are you endorsing any particular brand of yoga mat? No. Currently. No. no. <laughs> no. Just a, for example. It, it was, but, it was, it was, I don't know why it was the first thing to come to my mind because I don't I love it. I have love it. yoga mat. <laughs> ah! I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave Los Angeles. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, uh, certainly being with a new studio must be uh, a really uh, exciting experience just in terms of working in a, in a different medium, even if the product seems or is essentially the same and it's a 30 minute period of time and it's scripted and uh, all those kinds of things. But uh, have you found in your experience that it's somehow different uh, performing, knowing that, that people are going to be watching on, we'll say, uh, alternative devices? I use, use that no, term. No, I, um, I've done like a few like co-stars, um, guest stars on, on, on television shows and I think that the last thing you're thinking, well, for me, the last thing that I'm thinking in the moment performing is how a person will watch it. And <laughs> Fair and enough. Share their watch it on. But that is very different for me with stand up. With stand up, I do think about that because you, so, so I remember I did a set on HBO and I didn't feel like the audience was the best possible audience for uh, stand-up comedy TV taping. But because I've done stand-up efficiently for nine years at this point, and I've taped enough TV for, with stand-up, I knew that what the audience doesn't, I mean, what the TV audience doesn't see, however they're watching it, whether it's a device or on an actual television screen, they, they see very little of the audience. You know, stand-up sure. is all about you and so if the audience if the studio audience isn't that great then i just focus on i'm like all that matters is the at home audience and i start performing for who i know will be watching in the future right, right. you know and, sure. and that, that's sure. always a larger audience uh, uh, you know in, in a in a stand-up taping you may have anywhere from a hundred to a thousand people but when it goes out to the world then millions of eyes get on it you right. know, hopefully. Sure. And um, how, did, how did that, um, how does that compare with uh, when you were on Last Comic Standing? Because wasn't that usually just the judges watching your Oh, reaction? no, no, no. no. Oh. Last, comic, Last Comic Standing has a live audience. Oh, yeah. That, that's so right. So you have the three judges and then you probably have about, you probably performing in front of like anywhere between like 750 to 1,000 people. It's a, it's a pretty, it was a pretty large audience. Um, and that was one of my first, that was early in my career. I, I was on Last Comic Standing three years into comedy. Um, but the good thing about it is I was, Last Comic Standing didn't air how it was shot. So the night that, my first night performing on Last Comic Standing, 25 comics had to go up and do five minutes. And that sounds like, that sounds like a short show, right? 25 times five, that doesn't sound like a long time. No, it's very long. You set up the camera, it set up the audience. I mean, the, 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 
The audience needs a break sometimes. The judges are giving their separate opinions. So the audience was there for about seven hours, which is Ooh. not typical of a live stand-up show, right? <laughs> we, we don't want them there longer than 90 minutes. Right. You know, right. We, want them long, we want them there long enough to get drunk, laugh, and leave safely, right? <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. it. But so not only were they there for seven hours, but I was the 24th comic to oh, go up. Oh, no. I was the 24th comic to go up. I had been there since about one o'clock in the afternoon. I probably got on stage. My TV set that you see, I probably went up at 11.45 p.m. That's crazy. That's but crazy. the beautiful thing about me in that moment was in the green room for hours, I was around comedians who have been doing comedy for 20 plus years. And so their stories and their camaraderie, I felt completely out of place. I didn't feel um, like I belonged there. I didn't feel like I really deserved to be there because I, I just had three years, you know? I don't even sure. know if I had a full three years. Um, it was very, very much male. I was one of the only women there. So what happens with me when I feel like all the odds are against me is I say effort. Nice. Now, what I realize, yeah, I don't know if, if I can curse on this. Oh yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah. Oh yeah, I say yeah! fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, and what I learned my first night taping last comic standing is that I do quite well when I say fuck it. When I don't care, no fear. When I feel like I have nothing to lose, I'm just being me at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And being me services me well. <laughs> I love it. Well, the other thing is that you know, as I think about that and say, wow, three years, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, in the end, Funny is funny, and, and we all know people who just have a great natural sense of humor and can sort of characterize things and storytelling, et cetera. So, you know, to me, the fact that, that you might have had those feelings, definitely fuck it. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that we always, um, it's like so um, inspiring, right? When you have like a young kid that can play Mozart. Or yeah, a seven-year-old seven that can do calculus. We're like, oh, we mm -hmm. got to nurture this individual, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think about, have you guys been watching, one of my favorite things that I've watched and the most impactful and inspirational thing that I've watched during this quarantine was The Last Dance on ESPN. Yeah, I just now, finished I, it. Yeah, I never thought I would ever watch any sort of narrative show on ESPN. You got to know. Right? That. <laughs> absolutely. I, you know, but the, the, one of the things that stood out to me, um, may, maybe it was Charles, Charles Barkley, it was somebody, it was an opponent of the Bulls said that in the final out, in the, in the final game, in, in game seven, where Jordan wins is that he had more experience being in the championship than they had. You get what I'm sure. saying? Sure, yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's still basketball, but it's a whole different arena. It's different, yeah, it's, it's different. And so as much as I said F it that first episode, now my second taping, and I'm like, oh, now I, I proved that I can be here. So now my expectations are high. And now I'm just like, how do I handle the pressure? But somebody who, who's done it 20 years, they know how to handle the pressure, which is why now I'm saying seven years, you know, four years after that, that's the reason why I can take a taping and know that if the audience that's in front of me isn't going well, I don't care. Because this isn't for them. This is for the TV. This is for the ad right. audience. You right. know? Sure. And, and in a situation like that, you've vetted your own material and you've practiced so you know your performance. So, yeah, even if the, if the in-person audience isn't going for it because they got to go to the bathroom or something like that yeah. that's that is endemic in in yeah. a taping situation like that yeah. <laughs> and everybody knows in LA sometimes right. the best place to tape a comedy special in L is, in L is Los Angeles because your audience are performers and actors and people who sure. wish they, they're like failed comedians and they're just looking at you like you're not gonna get none of my laughs Right. <laughs> you up there living my dream. I'm not giving you laughs too. <laughs> right. <You got> <laughs> right. Open mics are that way too. 
Oh, open mics are the worst. Oh, that's funny. All, They're like all necessary, the, uh... you know, because people don't pay you to bomb, but but they're 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 the worst. Then you're also on Seth Meyers. I bet that energy hat was much more there for for that audience. Tell us about that. So um, Seth's studio audience is probably I don't know I would say in between 100 and 150 people, which is really nice for you know late night studio audience. Um, I I remember the the best advice I got was from my co-host on 100 Humans, which is Sammy Obey. He said he had taped Conan a little while before I did Seth. And he said, just have fun. He said, he said, yeah, people are going to tell you about your material. He said, but what I found helpful is to have people in my green room that have such good energy that they make me forget about what I'm about to do. And the reason for that yes. is because what you do, you've practiced your set. Sure. You, you've run that set for long. Yeah. You could do that set. I mean, if you get up there and you forget that set, that's that's like spirit now. That's like you just ain't supposed to say these words in front of right. you. Right. <laughs> because you know the set, you've practiced it. But he said, you know, first of all, it's the host show. It's it's whoever it is, right? For me, right. in my case, it's Seth Meyers' show, right? And he has a team of professional writers writing every single joke that he has perfected giving to his audience, right? So that so you're already competing with an hour of professionals writing these amazing jokes. Yeah, and like 15 people writing jokes. Exactly. And then the second group that you're competing with is the celebrity. And they're already known. The guests right. are all celebrities that people love. So even if they're not funny, they're going to laugh anyway because that studio audience is, ex audience is excited that they are seeing, I don't know, Heidi Klum, fill in the blank. You know, who, who, who's sure. your best celebrity? So right. now you go out after these well-written jokes, the celebrity and their shebang, right? And you're at the very <laughs> end of this show. You're right. at the very end. The audience feels like, oh, I already got what I came to get. Right. <laughs> Who's this person? I don't know. You want me to sit here for five extra minutes for this person we don't know? You know? Oh, well, I, I, I want to say that I hear exactly what you're saying. I understand your sentiment, but as somebody who's, you know, certainly not scientifically, but enthusiastically watched those kinds of shows my entire life, I always am excited about the comic. And in some ways, and this is sort of an adult observation of the entire narrative or the, the arc of doing this since I was a little kid sitting in front of the television, is that you know that if somebody makes it to the Tonight Show or the Late Show or, or you know, whatever any of those top tier shows are, they've been vetted. So if Zainab is the, is the person, man, I can't wait. It's, this is going to be great. And also, as a consumer of jokes, I know that you're stoked, right? You're like, what? I'm, you know, that first time. And it's like, I can't so, even imagine how awesome that must be. So it was really, it was really awesome, but it was awesome because I did exactly what Sammy advised. I made sure that people were there with me. They, I made sure my siblings were there with me. And so they, they, they made me think about everything except what I was about to do out there. You know, right. they right. made energy fun. All I had to do was make sure I got from backstage to the mark on the floor in front of the camera without falling <laughs> the heel, the high heel, the heel right. that's, that's all I had to make sure. That was my only, my only cause for concern. Please let me make it without tripping or falling right. on the heel. Jimmy but, Chu ruined my <laughs> But what I what I've realized in in we we at co comedians, stand up comedians, we love someone like you. But that is not see what, what I'm describing yeah, no, I, is, what what I'm describing is not something that people are conscious of. Sure. It's a it's a subconscious thing. If, if I if I've been on shows, I, I perform at the comedy cellar in New York all the time, right? I've been on shows and you be on a lineup and Jerry Seinfeld comes, Louis C.K. at the time came, uh, Chris Rock will come, 
et cetera, et cetera. And then you have somebody come on like me. And the audience is not like, we don't want to hear from you, but they're like, I, I feel like I'm done. Right. You, want, you, you know, I feel like I've gotten all that I could possibly get from a show. Right, um, right. You know, but also in my traveling, in my headlining the past few years that I've been headlining, I rec people come up to me all the time and they say, you know, this is my very first comedy show. Really? Now that, that's strange that's to awesome. me because I, I've, I've been to, I, I used to go to comedy shows before I ever even wanted to go to nightclubs, you know? Right. Right. But right. but some people, they are like, they don't even really know how a stand up show works. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. No, yeah. I know you're right. It's just hilarious to think. That, you know, and again, we're we're sort of in the crucible because we're fans of that art form. But exactly. I know exactly what you mean. And, and as a an audience member many times at Wise Guys here in Salt Lake and other places, too, of course. But uh, it's like you can kind of feel the energy of the new, I'm sure you are times 10 of this. You can feel the energy of the noobs in the audience who, who don't really know how to consume a live comedy show. And it's yeah. always kind of like, oh, geez, it's something like, else. It's like you said, you're like a fan of like, you know, watching television. I, my, one of my favorite pastimes is going to the movies. And so I am hoping that even in our new normal, that experience doesn't go away. I Boy. love going to a movie theater and mm -hmm. watching a good movie. I absolutely love it. Um, but it is something different to watch Titanic and actually be there with Jane the and be able to just watch. You ain't even got to be in a movie, but to be able to watch <laughs> James Cameron, Leonardo DiCaprio, and to watch right. what they're working with, because what they not, they're not in the middle of the Atlantic. Right. Right? They, Wait. They're not there. Wait. That's a big pool in Mexico. Did you just spoiler alert this? Listen, if somebody. <laughs> <this podcast. laughs> I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. You know, so I think that there's, I think that there's just a certain appreciation that once when you, when you see the sausage being made. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And, and it's, it's it's a beautiful, magical thing. Yeah. I almost I almost grabbed a nut to eat and then I realized I'm taping a pot is something audio. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think we're um, I think we're shelled nuts inclusive here at your creativity. So you can swear um, you can eat. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm not a big fan of Philadelphia, so I'm going to ask that, that no cheese steaks on the podcast, but otherwise it's pretty open. I've never heard that. Why are you not a fan of Philadelphia? Like the city? Oh, no, I was just making that up. Oh, okay. I, I, Philly's great. I haven't actually spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, even though I've spent a lot of time uh, in major cities on the East Coast. But, uh, you know, you don't you don't have to go too far into the history of music in Philadelphia. And if you don't love Philadelphia, just based on the music that's come out of there, then uh, I just threw, I just threw Philadelphia under the bus for, for the- For a uh, joke, look at you. For, oh, it's so <laughs> terrible. I'm so sorry, Phil. Now, now I'm gonna have to have, do a Twitter apology to the entire city of brotherly love yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, well, I, got, I got so much to do. <laughs> the Philadelphians are die hard. They love their city, so. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. But uh, in any case, uh, enjoy your nuts, and uh, I don't, hopefully, it's not gonna. Uh, I don't think it'll affect ratings at all. <laughs> you, you never know. <laughs> so, how do the two um, comedy markets differ, LA and New York? Um. The. I think that New York, I think that LA, um, I think people really love comedy he here, but the clubs are spread out. Um, I think that there are a lot of distractions, you know, LA, I think is the only city in the world, as much as there's many celebrities that live in New York, I think LA is like the only city in the world where you can like, 
you can people can like realistically and honestly say, oh yeah, um, I go, um, you know, my coffee bean is Brad Pitt's coffee bean. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, so it's the, it's the ultimate industry town. Yeah, no doubt I, about think, it. I think because of that, you 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 find that the audience in LA also feels like they're on display as well. And so it doesn't sure. quite allow, not all the time, I don't want to throw LA under the bus because I mean, I, this is where, this is actually where I started stand up. Um, I, I, I nurtured myself in, I, in New York, but I started here. Mm. But, but I knew it was necessary in New York. There's just so many places to perform. That New York is a pedestrian city. So you can, you, you walk down a block and it's like, Oh, oh, we got a comedy show here, a comedy show there, a comedy show there. You know, LA, if you go to the Laugh Factory and it's and, and the show is canceled, now you gotta you gotta get your car out of valet. You gotta drive, you know what I'm saying? It's just it's a it's yeah. it's a lot. Um, I think so so that's that's the experience of going out to see comedy, right? That that's how those two differ. As a comedian. Um, I think sometimes, and this is no knock to anybody pursuing comedy, um, I think sometimes LA is the place where you really want to be a star. You really want to be in television and film. And right. you have to figure right. out the best and quickest way to get you there. Yeah. You know, is it commercials? Is it, an, is it actually an acting class? Is it stand up? And I think stand up usually, like, I think stand up. In improv and sketch, I think that's a lot of people say, well, this is the cheapest way for me to sure. get there. Yeah. Um, and then I think once you get in it, you don't realize the amount of work that it takes to be good at it. You know? Yeah, when, um, for sure. I work for a Wise Guys Comedy Club here in Salt Lake. And when we had Rogan here after the show, he was talking about how you, you always need to nurture it. You don't, you can't lay on your laurels. Just always keep working in that. Yeah. That conversation stuck with me. I, I don't do stand up, but you know, I know a lot of comedians and that, that's probably the best advice I've heard. You yeah. Know. I, yeah, I think it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's like going to the gym. It's a muscle that you have to work. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a muscle that it's, it, it, I know now, and I'm scared. Like when I get on and do Zoom shows, I'm like, so I'm like a little bit nervous because I'm like, ugh, I'm rusty, you know? I'm like, sure. This is not an ideal way to do stand up. And also, I'm rusty, you know? Right. Um, uh, but I know on stage, as much as the audience is like, oh man, and how you did that and how you put it together, and did, like once you're doing it, you recognize how to make something funny. You know, it's it's almost like how, and when a person when a when a when a uh, cook is cooking for a long time, they no longer need measuring cups. Right. They know what you know, and I think this stand up. I think that a lot of things are like that. You know? Absolutely. But but yeah yeah. We certainly have. I have a lot of musician friends here in Salt Lake City, who are uh, lamenting. Of course, not only because they're. Uh, livelihood has been taken from them in, on many levels, but also that thing of, you know, there's something about those people sitting in front of you that gives you, literally gives you energy, the chemistry of Absolutely. a bunch of people being in the room. And I'm not sure if any of the uh, video providers have figured out a way to uh, approximate no. that. I don't think there is. Stand, stand up is a live art form it absolutely is what it is yeah. it's, it's, it's the same as i don't care how good a broadway show is i don't want to see it on television yep i want so to be true. right here in the theater and, and watch that show now you can you can recreate it for a film but i don't want somebody to have taped a stage play and right. put it on tv i don't want that right it ultimately that becomes your high school musical that you exactly. did that got saved. Exactly. <laughs> and nobody exactly. wants to watch that. <laughs> yeah, it becomes a home video. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. That means so, that I'm gonna watch Hamilton in July. 
<laughs> nice. Nice. So, Zaina, tell us a little bit about the journey from, um, from your childhood, your studies, which I, I have to say that um, on some level, I, I feel like I have a, a sense that, that, not that mathematicians are funny, but there's something about the process of mathematics, which of course is, is inestimably beautiful, but how does mathematics and the comedy go together in your progression? That's really cool and interesting to me. Were you, were you, were you cutting up in math class, in fact? No, they actually don't go together. Math is, math is a distant past for me. I see. So you left it behind. And... Yeah, no, I don't. I, um, I, I, I have 12 siblings, and my parents are, my dad has passed away, but my parents are wonderful people. Um, and my parents were, they did go to college, but neither one of them finished. And so my, we're like the first generation, me and my siblings, yeah. we're first generation college graduates. Me and too. I think that, I think that my parents, that now I would be able to look at my child and I would, they, they could tell me that they wanted to explore so many different careers and professions. And I would understand the possibility of that because of what I'm living through in my life. But my parents, they, they didn't have that. They didn't have the, the, experience to point me in any direction except you go to school yeah you go to you're gonna go to grad you're gonna get your degree and you're gonna get a, you know and i was sure. always i was always a really logical thinker i tested really high all the time in new york they had these programs called gifted and talented or magnet and very young when i was in first grade my mom got me tested and got me into a gifted and talented and I was always really good at ma re high reading scores, high math scores. But the thing that always appealed to me about math and the way that I process is you always arrive at an answer. Mm -hmm. And there's one answer. Right. You know, don't get me, now I'm a very, I'm a very different person. Now I'm like, but what's, what's your perspective? And how do you see it? And well, well yeah, that, I mean, that's her truth. Like what, what right. does that even yeah, mean, absolutely. right? Absolutely. But 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 growing up, what I what comforted me was one plus one equals two, and there's no universe where that's not the case. Right. There's no plane where one plus one doesn't equal two. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, but I do find that it is like in a you know as a comedian definitely, and as just a, a, a an artist. Um, whenever people talk to me or meet me or find things out about my life, it is one of those things where people are intrigued, like, ooh, you could have, you were good at math, but you chose to be funny? Oh, you know? Right. Your brain is humongous. Yeah, but no, I mean, the most that I do with math now is, you know, I'll trip up the Whole Foods cashier, I'll give her a 20 <laughs> and then give her 39 cents and see if she can do the math real quick, you know, or he can do the math real quick. Um, that's, that's the, I too, I, I help out my nieces and nephews now. They, the ones that are in like, you know, pre-algebra or my, when my siblings were going through calculus and stuff like that, I would help them out. But other than that, I'm not, it's, 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 it's a part of my past. Um, so on 100 Humans, they really wanted us to have a math and science background. They wanted the host to have a math and science background, not just be performers or comedians or, you know. And Sammy has, Sammy also has a degree in math. Um, and I think Allie is like a science course. She's heavy in the science, right? And I remember when I first met Sammy, we met at a comedy club, Comedy and Magic in Hermosa Beach in California. And he said, yeah, I hear that you um, study math. And I was like, yeah. And he said, okay, so what math materials do you do on stage? I want to make sure our jokes don't overlap. I said, oh, you got it. <laughs> you got you it. Got yeah, it. All right. <laughs> You ain't got to worry. One, you don't have to worry about me doing math. Like I talk about my, I talk about life. Relate. You know, I'm not. I'm not trying to figure out how to show the audience how I. You're not doing your math set anymore. You retired no. your math. No, 
No, I said, you got it all. Every single uh, joke. If I even think about a math joke, I'll send it to you. you yeah. Right. Have it. So let, let's get oh. into 100 Humans. I, I thought that was a really interesting show. 100 people, all these different situations. What are some of your favorite memories from that? Okay, so my favorite episode, and although a lot, some of the experiments didn't get aired, my favorite episode, shooting it and once it aired, was which is the best age to be alive? And that was when we broke them up into 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60 pluses. Yeah. And the reason why that was one of my favorite episodes is it was quite fascinating to see the difference between the different age groups. Um, and what, what our skills, what, we, what skills we naturally have being born in a different time. But the producers wanted us to be rooting for a specific age group. And it's obvious everyone, even if you're not in the 20s or 30s, you're going to root younger. Like, it's like the saying, the, you know, youth is wasted on the young. You, you yeah. know? <laughs> I'm, I, I am, I'm, I'm a 65 year old woman just waiting to age into my proper age. That's, that's my spirit, my spirit is a, is a, is a, is a graceful senior citizen, right? I love it. So I was rooting for the 60 pluses and very happy to do so. And they, they really did have a wisdom, in my opinion, that was quite beautiful. They were humorous, they were patient, they could communicate. Even, even they worked so, sm they worked smarter instead of harder. You get what I'm saying? It was yeah, wonderful. Also, that, yeah. once it aired, so my mom is uh, maybe 61 now. And when she watched the show, she told me, she said in the, in the episode where the, it was the ages were competing, she said, when you said you were rooting for the 60 pluses, I felt like you were rooting for me. And then, like, even just saying it, it makes me kind of emotional because, and, they, and I said it, so th that, part, that part never aired, but there was a part that we take where we root for who we're rooting for and we say why. And so I say, as I'm taping, I'm like, well, first of all, my mom just turned 60, so I'm definitely rooting for this, you know? <laughs> And so the fact that that never even aired, but she still sort of felt that from me, that just, that kind of makes me feel, I don't know, it's just, it's like little signs for me that make me feel like, yeah, you're doing right. You're doing, you know, you're, you can be proud of this little choice that you made, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I think, I think one of my favorite, I think some of my other favorite things were, the, the pain, the pain episode, where you're trying to see it like pleasure versus pain. Yeah. That episode blew my mind because I knew nothing was happening to them. And so to watch someone who nothing is happening to say, oh my God, that's a euphoria. I'm feeling euphoria right now. It's like. <laughs> Nothing's. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's an exercise, it's an, especially as yeah. a comedian, it's an exercise in me not breaking character. Yeah. Because there's moments where I want to say, now hold on, human number 42. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure you are feeling a pleasure sensation? On you know when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, on a scale from 1 to 10, you know, what's... what's right. Now I understand why sometimes they don't take people seriously because people really don't know. Yeah, right. Like what your body feels and what's happening in your mind can be two very different things. And it, is, it was quite fascinating to me. Awesome. Are, are there any plans for further seasons or is it kind of one done? We haven't heard anything yet, but I hope so. I hope so too. It was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed yeah, it. I hope so. It was, you know what? Doing that show was very interesting when you're trying to test things that are not science, science based at all scientifically. With, with humans, is that you can't tell them what you're testing, right? Because right. if you tell people what you're testing, they'll try to manipulate the results. Because people want to believe that they are a certain way. Um, so we had to figure out a way to do an experiment 
that looks like it's testing for one thing, but will show us, you know, will show us results for the test that we really want. Right. And then what happens when you do that is you find out something that you never even knew you were going to find out. You yeah. know? And I think yeah. that that was the, the very interesting aspect of working on the show. Did we lose Tyler? Uh, Terry? No, just video. Did I, Sorry. Did I lose? Sorry. No, your video's just gone. Oh, okay. So things got better. Oh! <laughs> huh? I I'm called kidding, you Tyler, Terry. Terry. It's okay. I've only been called Tyler 10,000 times in my life. But let me yeah. tell you why I did it. Because your name is popping up on my Zoom. It's Terry Burden. And a guy that I used to date, his name was Tyler Burton. So every time I look at your name, it's triggering his name, which is why I called you Tyler. It's, it's okay. And I hope that that's uh, at the very least, even though he's an ex, I'm not going to make any assumptions about the fact that he's an ex, that he's not a sterling human being. No bad blood. He's a great All right. guy. Nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm it. so mad now that I gave his full name on a podcast. <laughs> well, I can edit it out. Oh, no, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, bleep it out. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, what back to COVID, since it's changed our lives so very much in such a short time, what, um, what are you hearing and what are you expecting out of coming out of this time as someone whose job is to make stuff? And, you know, I, I saw uh, um, a story, I think it was in The Hollywood Reporter, uh, just in the last couple of days that, uh, I don't know if it's Warner's, is going to try and do a small film uh, fairly soon that they're going to shoot um, you know, at the studio, uh, on controlled sets, and you know one of the uh, one of the jokes was you know uh, say goodbye to the craft service table, but um, things are going to be different. What are you expecting? And yeah, what do you think about about sort of getting back up to speed? I mean, this is such a huge interruption, and I'm not thinking of of where you're at in your career with you know, clearly having a lot of uh, velocity and um, I'm sure you're, you're ready to get back and ready to crank it. Um, I, I don't think I'm concerned with television and film world because as we can see, you know, as I mentioned with the Titanic reference, so, so much can be done in the world of television and film to appear to be something, something grand, right? We sure. look, I mean, look at Avatar. Like there we have movies shot completely in front of green screen and then it looks yeah. like outer space. So that doesn't concern me. Uh, the, thing that, the thing that I get the most anxiety about is live performance. Uh, our concerts, our comedy shows, our theaters, our sporting events. Um, and of course, because that's my profession, you know, I, I tour the world doing stand up. And it's the thing that brings me the most joy. It's my job, but it, it's totally my passion too. I, I absolutely love being a stand-up comedian and I love performing live for people. So I've been hearing like, oh, oh, Pete, oh you ain't gonna be able to go on tour until 2022. I, I'm t I've learned, especially, I, I, I have been practicing this before COVID, but I have especially learned in COVID to take things one day at a time yeah yeah one thing at a time and like i said earlier i am focused on i have an attitude of gratitude i'm i'm optimistic you know and i focus on preparation so when it does come back i'm absolutely ready you know because because what i what i'm not going to want to see for my first comedy show if i'm in the audience and i done paid and it's a possibility somebody is in here asymptomatic with covid what i don't want to hear is a comic like oh you know i ain't i mean i wasn't even ready but you know i don't want to hear that yeah for sure you know yeah. so yeah so yeah I, you've had time yeah you exactly exactly yeah. so wait, come on what's your jokes because we don't we don't we don't know if everybody <laughs> in here got tested <laughs> That's no. right, and there's a, and there's also a third 
of the people in the room. So that energy is dissipated too. So be excellent. Be hilarious. Yeah. Are that, you writing? That new- quite concerning. That, yeah. The, the logistics of a third less people being in the room, that, that's really a financial thing. That's not, a, that's not really an energy thing because I've done shows where you think that, oh man, it's 17 people. It's like, oh, one night there was 17 people in the crowd. And then the next show, we got 250 people. But guess what? I had a way better time with those 17 really? people. Yeah. So the, the amount of people in the room, for the most part, that's, that's in my opinion, and I'm sure for a club's opinion and how they pay us and stuff like that, that's definitely a money thing. Yeah. Yeah. Are you writing new material? I am. Sweet. And I try not to write COVID material. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was thinking about everybody's that. Everybody's gonna have that. <laughs> yeah. You, 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 you. Have, we've all we're all living through it, so you'll be very. You be it'll it'll be easy to pull it out if you need to improvise. It'll be easy to reference it. It's like you know what I'm saying. But to actually write, I'm not doing a COVID special. My stand up is still. I've I, I lived 30 years before this pandemic. So I got 30 years worth of experience and story to tell. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, now, absolutely. I, I can see me doing COVID material 20 years from now to some 20 year old, like, look, look at you on your, <laughs> on your mobile device that's in your head. We yeah. live through a pandemic. <laughs> that's and my stay home to save the that's world. my 50-year-old <laughs> my, my, For some reason, 50-year-old comedic me turned into Bernie Sanders. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I love it. There's worse oh. things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you've got upload season two to to film too. Yeah, upload season two where uh, we get to film. Um, they're predicting um, that we that the ball will get rolling. But I believe season two is close to being finished. Like the writing is almost done, um, but the us getting back to set, they're predicting a late summer return. Um, and I think that that's probably optimistic. So I think that fall, I, I would love to be back in Vancouver um, in September and finishing out the year doing upload season two. That would just be, that would just float my boat. Well, I, I'm excited to work. I love it that the cast is great. How, how are they on set? You know what? Absolutely fantastic. And I hear that that, I hear that we lucked up. I hear that we lucked up with a cast that has like great, great chemistry. We all like each other. We all have so much fun. Uh, one of our, our lead, Robbie Amell, he's Canadian. Um, but the rest of the cast, we had never been to a hockey game. So we just got <laughs> together one day and we went and saw the Canucks, the Vancouver Canucks, right? Yeah. Um, and it was such a fun, fun, fun experience. I mean, I remember Robbie was laughing at me so hard because I was like, so the goal, so the goalie, he's not good, right? Because he's not stopping any of these. Like, I mean, me trying to figure <laughs> out, like, and I was, I was associating it to everything I knew about any other sport. I was like, okay, so this is like when they jump ball in basketball. Oh, okay, this is like when, like to make myself understand the game, but we, you know, we often had dinner together because we all we all had to live in Vancouver for the, the time that we shot. Um, we got to know each other's uh, families or love interests when they came to you know came to set and stuff like that. But overall, it's just a. I, I mean, I think that everyone is just so talented and giving, and we support each other. And I think collectively, every person from craft services, the PA. The, the Teamsters that drive us to, you know, Greg Daniels, we, it, to, to the Amazon executives that are on set, um, everybody wants it to be good and is doing their part to the best of their ability to make it what it is. Um, and I don't think that you can ask for anything more than that. It, it, it felt special being on set and it feels special watching the world receive it. And so I'm just, I'm really happy to be a part of it. Are you guys allowed to improvise or is it, you know, strictly what's on the page? No, no, no. We, we have room to improvise, um, especially with some of the comedy. Yeah. Um, but, but, but what I love about Greg is that he's very collaborative. He, he's, he's, he's one of those people that 
if it services the school, like, so there, there's a moment uh, where Alicia is saying something and I did about 10 of 10 takes of it. He comes out to me. It was an episode he was directing. And he comes out to me and he was like, this doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. And he doesn't have an answer yet. He's coming to you and hopefully together you guys can get the answer. Yeah. It's like, what, what would you say if this, if this was presented to you? Like, what would you say? And I was like, I would say this shit, whatever I said. And he said, say that. That. <laughs> Try that. But then fast forward to maybe like episode seven or eight, and he wasn't directing this episode. I decided to say a line. I decided to reverse it. For me, when I looked at the line, I thought about, because I, I knew that it was comedy, right? I knew that I was dropping a punchline. And so I thought, well, if I said this on stage, I would reverse it. My, the way my comedy works, I would reverse it. And so I'm saying it, and I'm saying I'm feeling good about it. I did about four takes. You could tell that the people, they, they can't laugh out loud, but you can tell it's being received well. And then Greg comes to me, excuse me, Greg comes to me in between one of the takes, and he says, I trust your comedic sensibility." He said, but with this line in particular, if you say it the way you're saying it, then we lose the information that it's going to provide for an upcoming scene. Oh, so okay. I need you to say it this way, because if you don't say it this way, you, you will have destroyed a bridge that is very important. And once he said that, see, I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking I got to deliver this funny line yeah, funny, that moment, right? Yeah. And so when, once he said that, then it made the way they wrote the line make more sense to me. And then I was just able to deliver it the way it was written. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that's so. collaborative like that. How do you feel about the comparisons to The Good Place? I think it's natural. I think people don't know how to talk about things without comparing. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Good Place was created by, um, you know, a, 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 a Cre television creative that, that that worked with Greg, you know, so it's yeah. natural. It's not, it's, it's about the afterlife. So it's natural. It has some, it has some very similar themes, both in front of the, you know, both in the storytelling and behind the, and behind the scenes that only, that it's like a no brainer that it would be um, compared. But, and I love this um, quote, I use it all the time on my podcast. I think it's from, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah, yeah. And I always try and remember that, even when I am trying to, um, if I wanted to recommend something to you guys, I, 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 would, I would try my best keeping that in mind to recommend it without putting something else into your mind. You know? Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that it's very natural. I think that The Good Place is a good show. And so if you're, it, I, you know, whenever you you are being compared, as long as it's in good company, then it's fine. right. You know. Yeah. So you you brought up your podcast. Um, we'll talk about that and then kind of wrap things up. So okay. you just released your ninety fifth episode. You are our ninety fifth episode. So, what? Yeah. How's that for? <laughs> how's that? That is so uh, wonderfully ironic. Yeah. Synchronicity. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. So give us a little background about your podcast and how you got started and all that. So my podcast is usually a short episode. It, it can range anywhere from like 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Um, although I have been doing longer episodes during the quarantine because we got time. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I found that I, one, I wanted to, I wanted people who liked my comedy and were interested in my perspective. I wanted them to be able to interact with me or engage with me, even when I wasn't able to be in their city. You know, right. I wanted, the, even when I'm not on their TV screens, even when I, I wanted them to take me to work with them. You know what I'm saying? And I think podcasts do that. Yeah. Um, the content of my podcast is anything and everything. I find that in this world, for me, especially with the internet, I find that a lot of information that is given to us, even on the news, it's very little fact, right? And so part of my joy is picking up, figuring out what's true, what's not, and how I feel about it. What's my opinion on it? 
And so that's just what my podcast is. Sometimes it's going to weigh heavy politics because that's just what's heavy on my heart. Sometimes it's going to be a real good story about what happened to me when I went to the Target. Sometimes it's going to be what I tried to bake a cake and I didn't realize there was a difference between baking soda and baking powder. You know, like <laughs> it, 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 yeah. it's anything and everything, but it is most importantly, Zayn. Um, and the name just came from one night I was one night after performing in New York. It's about three o'clock in the morning and me and two other comedians were in the cars. You were in a car, you know, go, being dropped off at our prospective addresses. And my friend was at the this comedian was asking advice. And I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty bottom line person. I think when I, I think when I talk, I think math comes back, like the logic comes back. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty logical person. Yeah. Um, and so long as it's not my own situation. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but my friend, I just kind of like bottom lined it for her. Like I was very honest with her. I was, you know, a bit, I was a bit, uh, you know, creative in the way I said it, but, but most importantly, it was honest. And, and I'll never forget, she said after, after she just had to accept the truth, she said, okay, honest T with Z. <laughs> And I said, oh, I think I'll title my podcast that. So even when you listen to the podcast, you'll hear the voice that says, honest T with Z is not my voice. It's the, it's the comedian's voice who, who named the podcast. Oh, nice. That's yeah. awesome. Now, let's, let's get to our bonus questions. We've got okay. three of them. Uh, the first one is, what does creativity mean to you? Creativity means following whatever your heart's desire. Whatever your, whatever your heart and your mind come up with that day, see it through. And that can be anything. That can be, that can be a journey. That can be a walk. That can be taking a picture. That can be cooking something. That can be writing something. That can be exploring a conversation that's usually hard. You know, I think, I think life is art. And, you know, the more we live, the more we create. That's nice. I like that. The next one is, who is your favorite Muppet? <laughs> you know what's funny? I don't think I know Muppets enough. Well, you can do Fraggle Rock, Muppet. Sesame Street, anything Jim Henson. Oh, any, um, I'd have to say that my favorite Muppet right now is a character online named Keisha Jones. Um, and Keisha Jones is like this, this, she's just a puppet online. She's pretty popular on Facebook and um, YouTube. Her name is Keisha Jones. Okay. I'll check yeah. it out. Yeah. And then the last one, I always, it's always weird when I have to ask actors this question because it's what you do. In the movie of your life, who would you want to play you? <laughs> um, in the story of my life, who would I want to play me? Um, ooh. Oh my God. I, 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 ooh, I don't, I have no idea. I mean, ooh, I, I don't, I have no idea. You can I, play you. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah, I could, I could play me, but like, so there's like young performers that come up for me, like, so on, there's a Netflix show right now from the creator of Blackish. I think it's called Black AF. Have you guys heard of this show? I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Watched it. Yeah, and there, there's a, there's a, there's, it's about the creator of Blackish, and it's sort of like style, like Curb Your Enthusiasm. But so he has five kids on the show, and there's the daughter who's like the lead kid, and she is, she is, I don't know, it's a shame I don't know her name, but she is quite fantastic. Even just watching one, like half of an episode, I I, let, I walked away telling everybody, but the daughter, the daughter, you know, she's yeah. she's a she's a just a fantastic. She's somebody that I can't like take my eyes off of. I find her interesting. I think she has good comedic timing. Um, so she was the first person that came to mind when you asked me that question. But then right after that, Kerry Washington came to mind. But I'm like, Kerry nice. Washington, she be doing, she be, be real dramatic. She got a lot of isms that just, I don't have, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. If somebody decided to make a movie 
about my life I, that I would be honored. And I would be honored. So, What's good luck to whoever plays me in the future. So, if, if, if people want to catch what you're doing, uh, where can they, you know, find your socials and all that? Uh, all my social media handles is Zainab Johnson. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, although I'm probably most active on Instagram. Um, Zainab Johnson, Z-A-I-N-A-B Johnson. I always assume people know how to spell Johnson. My website is ZainabJohnson.com. Z-A-I-N-A-B-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, everything. You can Google me on YouTube. It's just my name. It's Zainab Johnson. And watch, upload, watch 100 Humans. So much fun. Both yeah, listen projects. to Honesty with Z. It's available everywhere you get podcasts. Honesty is spelled H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. Like, it's like honest gossip. Get it? Get it? Get it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. This thank was... you so much, Dylan, and thank you so much, Terry, for talking to me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. It's so exciting to uh, see you. Just sounds like, like you're right there, like the, the explosion. And of course, as, as you alluded to earlier, uh, stand-up is so important and so central, and, yeah. uh, and you're doing it. So uh, best post-COVID wishes to you, for thank sure. You. Thank you so much, you guys. You guys have a wonderful night. Stay safe. Same to you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.